good friend of mine, who is a sensible investor himself, posted a picture to this effect on his social media, trying to highlight the effects of market crashes after multiple growth periods. Pictures like this are of course scary and do a great job of keeping people out of the equity market. Now here is my problem with people's interpretation of market corrections like most of the commenters were obviously looking only at the events in the stock markets and that too in one single period. Now if someone is assuming that once investing life comes to an end at this point of time in year 5, then of course it can be a very traumatic experience for them. However, if someone is focused on the underlying business and has some cash or even dividends to reinvest, then this can be a fantastic opportunity to buy 33% more shares in year 5 just because of this correction as compared to what they would have otherwise been able to acquire. A lot of people miss out on this compounding that takes place in form of accumulation of shares and this video discusses this concept of accumulation. If you have read the book Snowball by Ali Schroeder, you would realize that Buffett was a lifetime accumulator, be it great businesses or be it great friends. So let's do an experiment. Here are two scenarios. Scenario one, the broad market did not experience any such correction as depicted in the picture earlier and ends up at a certain level in the long run. Let's say our investing company ends up just above $300 a share in a 10 year period, starting from $100 and without that scary drop in year five. So that's about a 12% annualized return and nothing shabby about it really. In scenario two, the broad markets reach the same level in the long run, but with that significant and scary percentage drop for a couple of years in between, like exactly what you would expect during a recession. However, the markets eventually pull up like they usually do and our investing company reaches the same level in a 10 year period as in scenario one. So generating the same 12% annualized return in terms of share price. The investor who focused on the underlying business, which I'm hoping our viewers would be, would have a materially larger portfolio in future, maybe by the seventh or the ninth year, if he keeps accumulating shares. And thanks to that 25% drop in the fifth year in scenario two, he will be able to accumulate more number of shares during that period. This reality is often hidden behind the clouds of panic during times of a stock market correction. Often unable to take the drop in market value of the portfolio, inexperienced investors end up selling at this point. And the result? They convert notional paper losses into permanent losses. Now, such selling at depressed prices is akin to converting an undervalued asset, which is the business in this case, into possibly overvalued assets, which is the cash. And that's an absolutely terrible decision. This typically happens because most people do not take the wisdom of accumulation of undervalued shares into the picture. And this is where the math suffers. No consideration is given to what happens after this correction for a portfolio comprising high quality businesses that stay the course. Well, if investors have leverage to buy their stocks and if they're so stretched for cash flows that in year five, is the exact time when they need to sell their holdings to raise cash for the expenses, then God help them. They obviously would be in a very disadvantageous situation during the market correction. But on the other hand, if investors are not constrained cash flow wise, they do not need to participate in such market mayhem as a seller. For this to play out to their advantage, they should be able to sustain their living expenses from cash flows they generate otherwise. These investors would actually salivate at such buying opportunities that Mr. Market is throwing at them. In this picture, I have assumed that the investor is accumulating additional shares every year and investing $100,000 every year. Now don't worry if you don't have $100,000 to invest. The number of zeros really don't matter. The principle remains exactly valid even if you remove or add a few zeros. So you can do the same exercise with $1,000 or you can do the exercise with a million dollars. So we can see that in scenario one, where there was no market crash, the portfolio generates an XIRR of about 12.5%. Whereas in scenario two, the market crash between year four and year seven allows significantly higher number of shares to be purchased. 
and that increases the cumulative number of shares in the portfolio, resulting in a significantly higher XIRR for portfolio 2 over portfolio 1. So you can see the market correction actually helps a net buyer. This is just the same picture in a graphical form and you can see how the cumulative number of shares, they diverge uh, with the crash. The red line is uh, scenario 2 where the investor gets to accumulate higher number of shares. And as a result, the value of the portfolio also diverges in a positive fashion. Now, deeper the correction is, it allows a larger accumulation of shares to net buyers or larger repurchases by the company. And that leads to a larger portfolio value over time. It's a very interesting irony. What most people are scared of is actually something that can potentially help them. Even if an equity investor may not have the spare cash to take advantage of these opportunities, they can benefit enormously if the businesses they hold have excess cash on their respective balance sheets. Now to discuss that, let's digress a bit and bring in a discussion about something known as look-through earnings and look-through cash. Buffett beautifully explains the concept of look-through earnings. When we own a stock, if we are able to think of ourselves as a part owner of the business, then there is no reason why we should restrict our evaluation of the yield to only the dividend. In the long run, the appreciation of the value of the business would be directly dependent on how the business is growing its earnings. And this would in turn depend on how well the business is reinvesting its retained earnings. The proportional share of that retained earnings also belongs to us because we are owners of the business. So as you can see in this picture, the company starts with a certain amount of equity capital and then the company operates for the year and generates some net profit. Part of the net profit gets distributed as dividends to the equity holders and the remaining part is retained by the company which gets added to the equity capital as retained earnings. Now our share of this total earnings of our portfolio companies is our look-through earnings. Shouldn't a similar approach be applied to the cash on the balance sheet of the business? Let's take the example of Facebook. Facebook has a cash plus equivalent of $10 billion and a short-term debt of $1 billion as of December end 2018. And here I'm not even including their short-term investments because you know during a market correction, it's possible that those short-term investments also might lose in value. We are just looking at the cash and cash equivalent. And if we take out the total amount of debt from that, Facebook had a net cash of $9 billion. Now, Facebook has total outstanding shares of $2.92 billion. So effectively, fa Facebook has net cash of just above $3 a share, $3.08 a share on its balance sheet. If an investor owns a thousand shares of Facebook, why shouldn't it not be appropriate to say that the investor's share of the cash is $3,084? So let's extend the concept of look-through earnings and call this cash the look-through cash. And this is our money. If I'm an investor in Facebook, this is my money. Of course, the investor can't call up Facebook and ask them to send him a check so that he can pay his credit card bills with this look-through cash. I mean, they'll laugh at him and they'll hang up. But nevertheless, as investors, we have claim on our share of, of the money. So if Facebook liquidates his business tomorrow, I mean, this money should come to the investors. Now, we ourselves may not have the spare cash sitting in our bank account waiting to perfectly time the market. But imagine situations where the CEO of our business has a history of repurchasing shares at hefty discounts to their intrinsic value. Whenever such opportunities presented themselves, like it did in year five, these situations would result in magnified gains for the remaining shareholders in the long run. The kind of gains that would not have materialized without the severe correction that we discussed earlier. I mean, something similar can happen when the CEO very sensibly does acquisitions. I mean, not for purpose of empire building, but 
if he makes sensible earnings attractive acquisition, it will result in the same thing for the remaining shareholders. And here I'm not talking of any CEO. I'm talking of the likes of CEOs who have been written about in the book Outsiders by Thorndike, who are some of the best capital allocators around. So rather than just sitting on a lot of cash, trying to time the market, trying to wait for a recession to come so that we can start purchasing, and in the process, foregoing the benefits of compounding, I would rather have the money invested in a portfolio of very healthy businesses that themselves have the cash buffer on their own balance sheet and are run by CEOs with fantastic capital allocation track record. And I'm very comfortable with letting our CEOs use our look through cash to do the purchasing on our behalf. If you found this video interesting, then you should definitely join our research platform. It's completely free to join. There are no hidden costs. And that's where we publish our free research on several high quality businesses, which are typically compounders. The link to join is available in the description section below. And I also welcome you to join our Facebook group called the Investment Forum. That's a place where we discuss these high quality businesses with several other DIY serious investors. And you will benefit from the discussion, I'm pretty sure. And if you enjoyed this video, can I please request you to hit the like button and do subscribe to our channel. It does not cost you a penny, but it'll really help us with the YouTube algorithm. And we will be able to notify you whenever we are coming up with other interesting videos on company research or other investment concepts. So I'll see you in the next video. Thank you very much for your time.